Hello. The original audio did not work in the recording for this lecture, so I am re-recording the audio after the fact um, and trying to recreate some of what the students and I talked about, and I apologize for the awkwardness of this recording. In the previous lecture, we talked about NK cell recognition. Specifically, we discussed the importance of both NK inhibitory and NK activating receptors, which are shown here, and some of the specific ligands for the activating receptors, as well as the importance of MHC class one as a receptor for the inhibitory ligands. And we discussed the fact that NK cells are really doing sort of a sum of the different types of signals they are getting through multiple receptors. If they receive more inhibitory signal than activating signal, then those cells will be inhibited. If they receive more activating signal than inhibitory, they will be activated. Um, and so um, when we think about NK recognition, we think about the importance of these receptors and the balance between these two types of signals. As is implied in that description, NK cells express a combination of different receptors. So instead of having just one receptor um, binding one ligand, like a lymphocyte would have, a B cell or a T cell, NK cells have many different receptors that can each bind to different ligands. Um, that we've discussed. One thing that is also of interest about NK cells is that, um, as I mentioned, NK cells, particularly NK inhibitory receptors, um, bind to MHC molecules. Um, MHC molecules are, as we discussed earlier, the most polymorphic um, encoded by the most polymorphic genes in the human genome. NK receptors are also quite polymorphic from, between individuals. And just like we know that there are disease associations between particular HLA types and different diseases, we also do see some disease associations with particular NK receptors. And in fact, the combination of particular NK receptors like the KIRs shown in this table along with certain HLA types um, does have a um, particular association with a number of different disease states. So you can see this with some infectious diseases like AIDS and hepatitis C virus, um, some tumors, um, cervical neoplasia, as well as malignant melanoma. Um, psoriatic arthritis and type 1 diabetes. And you can also see this association um, with preeclampsia, um, which is a pregnancy complication that you may not have um, thought about as being immune related. NK cells, in fact, are quite interesting um, in pregnancy. They are one of many, many, many aspects of pregnancy immunology that is uh, quite intriguing. And we can talk a little bit about some things that happen with NK cells and uh, pregnancy. When you think about um, a fetus, a fetus is going to, of course, be half foreign to the mother. It is certainly going to be missing some self cells. Um, and you might imagine that mom's NK cells um, could come in contact with um, aspects of the fetus and could uh, try to destroy that. One particular cell type that's really important when we think about pregnancy is this cell type that is, let's see, um, this cell type that is shown sort of partially here coming from the blastocyst um, so this is the embryo, this is the uterine lining. You can see that there are some of these purple embryo cells that sort of invade um, uterine tissue. 
and will um, actually sort of be the cells that are in direct contact with mom's tissue. Um, this is known as the ex these are known as extravillous trophoblast cells, um, and they are helping to um, make the contact between some of mom's vessels uh, to feed the fetus. Those cells of the extravillous trophoblast, which you can see here still in purple, encode a large number of different um, MHC class one like molecules that will all, and MHC class one molecules as well, that can all serve to um, bind to NK inhibitory receptors and keep NK cells in the area turned off. Um, and so this NK inhibition um, from these many NK inhibitory receptors on the extravillous trophoblast is one of uh, many immunologic specializations that allow pregnancy to go forward. So at this point in the lecture, we went back to a question that I brought up in the previous lecture, which had to do with classifying NK cells either as innate or adaptive cells. And we talked about many of the different properties of NK cells and whether they were properties that might make one classify the cells as innate cells or whether they might make us classify the cells as adaptive cells. We discussed the fact that NK cells have many different receptors that are not allelically excluded and that the fact that they do not perform VDJ recombination um, as reasons why we couldn't call them adaptive cells. Um, so in fact, we called them sort of more innate cells. We also saw that the timing of their responses to viral infection, shown here in the blue uh, part of the graph, was in fact providing an early response to viral infection. Um, again, uh, rather indicative of more of a um, innate type of response. However, we also discussed these cells as being from the lymphoid lineage. Um, we talked about the ways in which their functions seem similar to some functions of cytotoxic T lymphocytes, CTLs. And so those things all made us think about NK cells and adaptive immune responses. And we felt as though the cells were a little bit sort of confusingly on the border between these two um, types of responses. And we said maybe if we really had to, we'd probably want to put them with innate cells, but it, it felt sort of uncomfortable and difficult to classify. And as I mentioned in the lecture on this day, um, that was sort of where things were near the end of my time as a graduate student. However, then there was another phenomenon that was described, and that was a phenomenon of NK cell memory. What was shown was that when an NK cell um, is activated, um, and this does seem to, uh, at least at first, this was first described with only certain types of NK receptors and certain systems, but those NK cells seemed to expand um, and then seemed to contract very much like we see in an adaptive immune um, response. Um, we could see that those cells that had previously experienced um, this uh, signal would then be more effective in vitro at killing um, than naive NK cells as if they were sort of the activated, more activated effector cells, just like we see with a T cell response. We could also see that if we transferred these cells into uh, immunodeficient mice, we could protect them from infection. Um, here you can see some of the data where we can see um, what happens with these cells over time. We can see that at the beginning, um, we see a uh, relatively small percentage of cells, 1.23% of the cells in this experiment were um, these NK cells. And you can see that over time, we have an increase all the way up to 19.9, and then we sort of come back down. Again, following that same kinetics curve that we see for activated adaptive immune cells, um, and not really what we think about 
um, in terms of sort of clonal expansion for innate immune cells. Um, we can also take some of those cells that were previously activated and transfer them into um, these neonatal mice who are immunodeficient and challenge them with a virus. Now, if we just take the mice, we don't give them any cells, we just give them some saline and challenge them with the virus, we see what is shown here in blue, where we see the percent of the mice that survive. And you can see that the majority of the mice uh, die by day 10 following infection in this model. And if we add in some NK cells, so we give those mice some NK cells, specifically we're giving them 10 to the fourth or 10,000 NK cells. Um, and these are naive NK cells, NK cells that have not previously experienced um, their, uh, this infection. Um, we can see that we can partially protect the mice. So some of them survive and we also see that they're surviving, um, even those that uh, pass away are surviving a bit longer. If we transfer in more NK cells into another group of mice, now we're transferring in 10 to the fifth naive NK cells, so 100,000, you can see that we get an even better response. More cells um, seem to work better. But finally, if we look at some of these NK cells that had previously experienced uh, this infection, these quote unquote memory NK cells, um, if only 10 to the fourth um, or 10,000 of those cells were transferred in, you can see we have an even better survival advantage. These cells are, in fact, more active than the uh, naive cells. And if you look at the green versus the red, which is a comparison of the same number of cells having been transferred, you can see that these cells are, in fact, quite a bit more active in um, eliminating the virus and protecting these mice. Um, and so we now think that think of the idea that this NK cell um, can be activated, can proliferate, can differentiate into more effector type cells, will contract, and may um, result in the formation of some long-lived memory cells that will make more of a secondary type of response. This type of phenomenon is has always been thought of as one of the defining factors of the adaptive immune response. And so this further complicates our question of whether NK cells are innate or adaptive cells uh, with this description of this phenomenon. Uh, and in some ways, this makes might want, make one want to throw up their hands in despair and uh, say, well, we don't know what to do. NK cells are just NK cells. Um, and we can't, we've since come up with this model. Um, at the beginning, we said, well, there are some um, innate immune responses that happen early. They're the same um, upon first or second infection. And K cells are a little bit later. They're also the same with first or second infection. And then there's sort of these adaptive responses that change with secondary infection. Um, but as we learned more about NK cell memory, we could in fact see um, differences in sort of the myeloid cell response, that more innate response, and that the fact that there are both primary and secondary NK responses. And this was the beginning of another sort of area of immunology um, being discussed. Because what we have learned is that there are a number of cells that come from the lymphoid lineage that have certain features of innate immune cells. So at the beginning of the semester, I told you about lymphoid cells, and I said that they are cells that come from the lymphoid precursor, and they are cells of the adaptive immune system, um, like B cells and T cells, which is generally true. But we now know that there are a number of different cells that come from the lymphoid lineage um, that have innate properties. Um, one of these is the, the NK cell, and there are some others, ILCs, or innate lymphoid cells. Um, and so what we've realized is that this perfect distinction between you know, totally innate cells, totally adaptive cells, does start to break down a little bit with the details. Um, when we look at innate lymphoid cells, um, as I mentioned, these cells are all coming, as you can see from your textbook, from the lymphoid lineage, from a lymphoid cell precursor. Um, the NK cell, 
has a lot in common with a CD8 positive T cell. You can sort of think of them as um, a cell that has a lot of similarities to CD8 positive T cell, but is um, on the sort of innate is one of the innate lymphoid cells. So maybe the innate lymphoid cell representative of a CD8 T cell. There are other types called ILCs, um, ILC1, 2, 3, et cetera. And what you can see is one kind of ILC um, involves a transcription factor called TBAT. One involves a transcription factor called GATA3. One involves a transcription factor called ROR gamma T. Um, all of which, uh, hopefully you recall, are transcription factors that we see in different types of helper T cells. Um, and so just like um, the adaptive helper T cells seem to go uh, polarize into different subsets that are working uh, to do different things, the ILCs seem to make some parallel types of subsets. Um, and so you can see here the NK cells um, in a lot of ways have a lot of similarities to um, CD8 T cells. They're sort of the ILC parallel of a CD8 T cell. ILC1s um, are the ILC parallel of a TH1 cell. ILC2s are a parallel of the TH2 cells. ILC3s seem to be parallels of TH17 cells. Um, we're seeing the same effector cytokines as you saw in the previous slide. We're seeing the same transcription factors. Um, and there seem to be a lot of uh, differences in these cells. Um, the or similarities in these cells with other types we've talked about. The big difference is whether or not we're seeing um, an antigen-specific response here. Um, we have also learned that there are some other types of immune responses that are a little bit on the in this gray area or on the border between um, innate and adaptive immunity. Some of our original defining features have gotten a little mushy. Um, one of these is in this area known as trained immunity. So again, we very traditionally talked about what the innate immune system looked like and some uh, classification of innate immune responses versus adaptive. Um, and we did sort of say, oh, well, uh, and you can see some of that here as well, sort of this idea of the classical immune memory, clonal expansion, all that good stuff. And um, we have learned that there is this phenomenon of innate immune memory, like what we see with NK cells, where NK cells can change their ability to respond over time. Um, there are also some macrophages that can actually make um, sort of memory or what are known as trained responses. All of these responses have to do with epigenetic changes, so changes at the level of the chromatin structure. So here we're not having a specific a clone of cells with a specific receptor um, being kind of the way we hold on to the memory. Um, instead, the cell doesn't have a specific receptor, but it holds on to the experience at the chromatin level. Um, and this is a newer area of the immune system, uh, much of which has been uh, pioneered by Mikhail, uh, Mikhail Natea, who is listed here. Um, that I think many immunologists are learning about. And so um, it seems as though when some of these innate cells um, are stimulated, they make changes, as you can see here, at um, the in their chromatin um, in order to respond differently, though they are not going to be responding necessarily with the same antigen-specific receptor. Um, one reason why this is also interesting and of importance is that this actually may be part of the primordial immune system. So we see trained immune responses in people, and we would love to learn how to harness them to impact human health. But as we've looked at other organisms that do not have adaptive immune responses, we see that these are types of memory responses or trained immune responses happening through epigenetic modifications in all of these different organisms um, including plants and invertebrates. And so, in fact, the trained immune responses and innate lymphoid cells may have been the original um, parts of the immune system onto which our adaptive immune memory response was added. Um, and this is something important to think about as we think about this relationship between innate and adaptive immunity. I think that sometimes people imagine this looking like what you see all the way on the left here. At some point, 
um, the adaptive immune system emerged. And we might imagine, well, the innate immune response kind of stopped evolving and adaptive immunity kind of took over and was where all the cool events were happening. Um, but if you think about it, that's probably not true. The innate immune response probably kept evolving um, as the adaptive immune response evolved. And in reality, when we look at any organism, we realize that not only were those two types of immune responses both evolving to over time, they were evolving together. They were feeding back to one another and influencing one another. And so there is not necessarily always a perfect distinction um, between where one type of immune response starts and another type of immune response, um, or one type ends where the other uh, starts. So for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to talk about the kinetics of a immune response, specifically focusing on some of the aspects of the kinetics of a primary immune response. This involves a number of different pieces of information that I've talked about elsewhere, but that I want to make sure you have together um, to help you kind of put them into context. And first, remember that we start out with, say, one naive B cell, one naive T cell that has not experienced antigen, um, but that has been made through VDJ recombination and that will leave the bone marrow or thymus. And at some point, those cells may encounter antigen, either free antigen in the case of a naive B cell or antigen presented by an antigen presenting cell on MHC class one or two um, in the case of a uh, T cell. Those cells will then begin to divide multiple times. Um, they have gotten a signal that they are useful and they now need to make many more copies of themselves and that process is known as clonal expansion. These cells will also gain a factor function. So they might go from being a CD8 T cell to a CTL or a CD4 T cell to a helper T cell or a B cell into a plasma cell. Um, and so we'll get differentiation into specialized effector cells. Um, and that will allow us to actually eliminate the microbe. And so we'll see our microbe get eliminated. Um, there are some things that do happen afterwards, one of which is a really important phase known as the contraction phase. And so you can see the contraction phase shown here where this peak number of cells that we had um, decreases quite a bit uh, through the process of apoptosis. There will be an increased number of cells left at the end of this response compared to what we saw at the beginning. Those cells will also be different than the cells we had at the beginning um, in that they will be um, memory cells. And we'll talk a little bit more about memory cells in the next lecture. You can see these same phases of the primary response here, um, the delay before we see a nice traditional adaptive response, um, that adaptive response stopping virus replication. But then you can also see that contraction phase and this decrease in CD4 and CD8 T cells that we see. Um, you can see yet another version of this here. But we should think a little bit about some of the phenomena that are going on throughout this process. When we think about the clonal expansion phase, for example, um, that is something that most people are actually aware of, though they may not know that that's what's going on. Um, this clonal expansion, as well as differentiation, is taking place in a secondary lymphoid organ like the lymph node. We have not yet had that cell leave the secondary lymphoid organ to go eliminate antigen yet. And so you can imagine if this cell is undergoing many, many, many divisions that and making many, many, many progeny in the secondary lymphoid organ, that the secondary lymphoid organ is going to be really crowded. It's going to become really, really packed with cells. Um, and just like any other location you could imagine that suddenly gets uh, very full, that area, that secondary lymphoid organ, like a lymph node, will start to swell because it's so crowded and there isn't as much space for all of the cells. 
you know about when you feel like you have some swollen lymph nodes, like the ones um, under your jaw, um, that f feeling uh, is where you are actually seeing that clonal expansion of those cells that are getting ready to go out and make a response. So when you talk about swollen glands, lymph nodes are not actually glands. That's a whole other problem. Um, but those swollen lymph nodes are all the result of the clonal expansion phase. Um, the contraction phase is also incredibly important. When I was in graduate school, some of my colleagues and I did some experiments where we tried to eliminate the contraction phase. We said, well, we're trying to make really good immune responses to a vaccine. Um, and we're sad that this eventual memory response is uh, way down here so low. What if we just stopped contraction and kept the response um, really high? And we realized that it was almost impossible to stop that contraction phase. Um, the cells are, in fact, programmed from the very beginning to contract. Um, and that contraction phase is quite important. Imagine what would happen if... Here's what I found you had those cells expand um, and expand and expand many fold. Um, sometimes we might see hundreds of divisions that these cells undergo and then not contract. By the time you were perhaps five years old, you probably wouldn't have any more lymph node space because you would have so many cells that had expanded in all of your previous infections. At this point in your life, you would likely be a walking lymph node. Um, and so it's really important that we get rid of many of those cells so that there are resources and space and cytokines and glucose uh, for the next round of cells to fully make a nice expansion. Um, we don't want to have sort of some leftover cells around that might block that expansion. Um, but there is a period of time where that response is in the process of contracting where it is higher than you had at the beginning and it is um, not all the way down to that memory level. Um, at that point, you probably have protective immunity. Um, if you are exposed to a microbe again during that point in time, um, you are probably going to have such a high immune response that you will block further infection. Um, and so this may be part of the reason why we see protection um, such high levels of protection um, shortly after infection and shortly after vaccination because that contraction phase has not yet happened and we're still kind of in this phase where we have an increased immune response that is protective. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, contraction phase is extremely important. Um, it is uh, characterized by a type of cell death known, known as activation-induced cell death. Um, that happens when these cells are activated. Um, and so when these cells are, very, are first activated by antigen, they are actually programmed eventually to undergo cell death. Um, some of this is related to signals coming from cytokines like IL-2. Um, we also see a lot of signaling uh, going on with FAS and FAS ligand. In fact, sometimes activated T cells can actually use fast and fast ligand on their membrane to kill themselves to make sure that those cells will contract. One of the many ways that we know that this um, activation-induced cell death or contraction process is really important is that we can see some um, situations where patients do not have this work correctly. Um, so as I mentioned before, here are FAS and FAS ligand, um, which are very frequently used um, for the apoptosis in the contraction, the cells that are contracting in activation-induced cell death. Um, there are some patients who are missing FAS or FAS ligand, um, and so they are not able to um, have their T cells contract as well as um, they normally would have. And those patients end up with a disease called ELPS or autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome, where in fact their lymph nodes stay swollen. You can actually see lymph nodes in this patient 
um, because the cells are not contracting, um, what's happening is that these cells that are no longer needed to get rid of a microbe, because the microbe is now taken care of, um, don't contract, don't undergo activation-induced cell death and undergo apoptosis. And since they're activated cells present at high frequency, um, sometimes we start to see a little bit of the self-reactivity of those cells come out, and those patients will have some excess inflammation and will have some autoimmune diseases. Um, and so this is one of many ways that we see that, in fact, if you didn't have contraction, um, even if you have sort of limits to the contraction phase that you see, um, you would actually uh, be quite unhealthy. Um, one other piece about contraction that I uh, want to mention is the fact that this is a, one of the phenomena that I talk about quite frequently when explaining some aspects of COVID-19 immunology um, and answering questions. Um, this is a major area of discussion. You can see some data here looking at antibody levels against SARS-CoV-2 following infection. And you can look at 1.3 months, 6.2 months, or 12 months following infection. I don't know why the investigators chose those times. Um, and we can look at the levels of antibodies um, against two different antigens that are part of this virus. And you can see the antibody numbers going down. And so we can see this contraction phase um, very obviously when looking at these data. I'm not sure I understand. When we look at this, um, some you, what you might think about now is, okay, look, look, this is great. This is exact evidence of the con uh, immunology she's been telling us. We can see the contraction phase here well. Um, however, when some people look at this, they say, oh my gosh, doom and gloom, terrible things are happening. Look, antibodies go away over time um, after SARS-CoV-2 infection um, or in uh, other data after vaccination. And some people worry quite a bit about this, but what you should realize is this is in fact a normal contraction phase. And if you did not have contraction of your immune response, um, bad things would happen. Now, there are important questions about this that are being debated in the literature. These two papers came out basically around the same day, and I always find them um, rather humorous because both of them are trying to address this question of what's happening with the contraction phase with SARS-CoV-2. There are people who are debating whether the contraction is happening faster um, than perhaps it should have um, should after SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, and you know to do that, you'd have to do some comparisons to contraction phases in other situations. So yes, there is some debate about whether the contraction is happening too quickly, but there should be contraction. Um, these are two papers, and first we'll look at the data um, where we can see um, time on the x-axis in both cases and antibody levels on the y-axis, and you can see the data that the two different studies show. In both cases, you see that contraction happening um, over time. Um, but what you will notice is that the two papers actually came to different conclusions about those similar data. The one on the left says that robust antibodies persist for months, while the other one on the right talks about this um, major decline. And um, as I would say, the jury's still out on exactly um, what's going on with the contraction in terms of whether it looks like a normal contraction phase. But the fact that there is contraction is um, perfectly acceptable and uh, expected. Um, when those cells have contracted, of course, we don't lose all of the cells that we gained. The number of cells that persist after the contraction phase is higher than the number that we started with. And so we do have more surviving cells. The cells that are present after the contraction phase um, are a specific type of cell known as a memory cell, um, which has some unique properties compared to the cells that we've seen earlier on in this process. Um, similarly, the effector cells that we see at the peak phase also have some different properties compared to the naive cells. 
you can see some of the differences between a naive cell and an effector cell here. And this is specifically looking at B cells. So with a naive B cell, we have a cell that is going to um, have uh, immunoglobulin or B cell receptor on its surface. It will have MHC class two on its surface. It can grow, it can mutate, it can switch, but it doesn't make huge amounts of antibody. You can also see that with when that cell has differentiated into an effector cell as a plasma cell, that cell has one job, and that job is making antibodies. Um, that cell is um, dramatically changed structurally, as you can see on the right. You can see that cell is basically all rough ER to be able to secrete proteins. You can also see that that cell doesn't have you know huge numbers of mitochondria. There's a lot of things missing in that cell. Um, and so that cell may not be specialized to live for an incredibly long period of time. Um, when we look at effector cells, um, we can see a number of differences between these cells and um, the naive cells that we had at the beginning. So what you can notice is that um, if we look at some different transcription factors, we see that those transcription factors are made at much higher levels in effector cells compared to naive cells. So we can do way more transcription. If we look at levels of many different transcripts, like these cytokine transcripts, we see that we are making huge amounts more of these cytokines. Um, we can also see that effector cells have gained um, a number of cell surface proteins. Um, in order to help them be effector cells while they have lost some other cell surface proteins. Um, this will be involved in their trafficking. This will influence their signaling um, and things like that. Many of those cells um, are known as terminally differentiated effector cells or short-lived effector cells. Those cells have transformed really well into cells that can kill um, virally infected cells or otherwise act against viruses. They are extremely specialized, but they're, in that specialization, those cells have lost abilities to keep dividing. They've lost abilities to live for a long time. Um, they've lost a lot of abilities. They're sort of going hard and using all of their metabolic resources to deal with this one infection right now. And they are programmed um, for cell death. Um, part of that contraction phase, in fact. Um, one of the areas of immunology that a lot of immunologists are spending a lot of time thinking about now is actually looking at the different types of metabolism that are happening between some of the naive effector and not shown here, but um, described in many other places, uh, different types of memory cells. Um, and so you can see, for example, that at the beginning, a naive cell is going to do a little bit more oxidative phosphorylation. Um, so that is sort of the more aerobic uh, type of respiration that we see in eukaryotic cells, um, a little bit less glycolysis. Um, and you can see that um, the glycolysis levels increase dramatically um, when that cell needs some quick energy. Um, and so we can now start to see a lot of glycolysis, a little bit less of um, oxidative phosphorylation. There are also some changes in fatty acid oxidation. Um, there are differences in these metabolic parameters between different types of helper T cell subsets. Um, and so understanding the immunometabolism of a lot of these processes is a key area of study. Um, as I mentioned, after you have this period of time where we've had the contraction of the adaptive immune cells, um, we will be left with some cells that are unique and that are known as memory cells. And next time we'll talk about what the properties of the memory cells are and what we see as part of the memory response.